Welcome to uh, lecture three of how to read and do proofs. Uh, before we do today's lecture, let's take a moment to review what we learned in the first two lectures. Uh, so first of all, we learned that uh, a proof is a convincing argument expressed in the language of mathematics that a statement is true. And a statement is a mathematical sentence that's either true or false. And of particular interest is the statement A implies B. And in lecture one, we saw, or we came to the agreement that the statement A implies B is true in all cases, except when A is true and B is false. And that led us to the understanding that when you want to prove that A implies B is true, you can assume that A is true, your job is to show that B is true. We also learned that the language of mathematics consists of a collection of proof techniques. Just as the game of chess consists of a collection of individual pieces, so of proof consists of a collection of individual proof techniques. And last time, we, in, chat, in the second lecture, we learned the, the most important proof technique, the forward-backward method. And with the forward-backward method, there are two processes. The forward process, in which you start with the assumption that A is true, and you derive from A new statements that are also true. We'll label them A1, A2, A3, and so forth. In contrast, the backward process is designed to help you reach the conclusion that B is true. And the way this works is you look at the statement B that you're trying to prove is true, and you ask that key question. How can I show that B is true? How can I show that a triangle is isosceles? How can I show that two lines are parallel? How can I show that a function is onto? These are all examples of key questions. And the most important thing I hope you recall from the key question is when you ask that key question, don't use symbols or notation from the problem. Ask the question in an abstract way without symbols or notation. Then after you ask the key question, you have to answer it. And today's lecture actually is going to uh, be devoted in part to learning different ways to answer that key question. In any case, with the backward process, you start with a statement B that you're trying to show is true, and through asking and answering the key question, you derive a new statement, B1, with the property that if B1 is true, then B is true. And that means you can focus all your attention on trying to show that B1 is true. By applying the, the backward process to B1, you can obtain a new statement B2 with the property that if B2 is true, then B1 is true, and so is B. And so what the objective of the forward-backward method is, is to obtain in the forward process precisely the last statement that you had in the backward process, at which time the proof is complete, other than writing it up as we learned perhaps in a condensed paragraph form. Any questions about what we did last time? Okay, so today's lecture uh, is gonna start with the concept of definitions. And let's look at what a definition is. A definition is an agreement between all parties concerned for the meaning of a term. In fact, we have already seen a definition in this series of lectures. In fact, in lecture one, we defined what it means for the statement A implies B to be true. We agreed that the statement A implies B is true in all cases except when A is true and B is false. That's a definition. A definition is an agreement for the meaning of a term. There are actually two different aspects to working with definitions. The first is you are given a definition and we want to learn how to use those given definitions in doing a proof. So that's the first uh, aspect of working with definitions. The second aspect is a little bit more uh, challenging. It's creating your own definitions. Now this is something we won't have time to do in this course, but I at least want you to uh, have some exposure to what it means to create a definition. Okay, so now what I want to talk about is when you are given a definition, how do we use definitions in proofs? And we actually use them in both the forward and the backward processes. So let's start with the backward process. One of the most common approaches to answering a key question is to use a definition. So for example, does everybody, anybody remember the very first key question that we had in lecture two when we did that proof with the, with the isosceles triangle? How can I show that? A triangle is isosceles? A triangle is isosceles. And what was the answer to that? How do you show that a triangle is isosceles? 
Show that two sides have equal length. Show that two sides have equal length. Where did that come from? The definition. The definition, exactly. So what I'm trying to point out is definitions are one of the most common methods for answering key questions. Not the only method. I will show you other methods today. But it certainly is one of the most common approaches to answering a key question. Okay. Um, the other use of a definition is in the forward process to simply create new true statements. Uh, so let me give you an example. If your statement A is the integer n is prime, you can create a new statement in the forward process by using the definition and writing, for example, A1. By definition, n is greater than 1 and can only be divided by 1 in itself. So to go from A to A1, we have used the definition. So is everybody okay with the concept of using a definition both to answer a key question in the backward process as well as to work forward to create new true statements? Okay, and we're going to see this over and over again. When you're going to define a mathematical concept, there may be different ways to define that concept. So for example, let's talk about an even integer. One way to define an even integer is to say that n can be expressed as 2 times some integer. So for example, the reason 8 is even is because 8 can be uh, described as 2 times 4. Another way to say that n is even is to say that n is an integer whose remainder upon division by 2 is 0. So the reason 8 is even is because when you divide it by 2, the remainder is 0. OK, so in this example, we have two possible definitions for an even integer, the statement A that you see here and the statement B. Now, again, a definition is an agreement between us. So we can choose which of these we want to be our definition, and we can agree upon it. For example, let's agree that A is our definition. By that, I mean an integer n is even if and only if n can be expressed as 2 times some integer. That is our agreed upon definition. So what happens to this alternative b here that you see? n is an integer whose remainder on dividing by 2 is 0. What we want to do is show that a and b are essentially the same. And essentially the same in, mathematical, in mathematics with regard to statement means try to show that a implies b and b implies a. If you can show that a implies b, then you'll know that whenever a is true, b is true. And if you can show that B implies A, you'll know that whenever B is true, A is true. And that means they're both true at the same time. And that means they're essentially the same. And we call that equivalent. OK. So what's the advantage of having these, the definition and, let's say, a number of alternative possible definitions? Well, what that means is when you are working forward, you can use any one of these alternatives. And that gives you a whole lot of choices in how you work forward. The same thing applies to the backward process. When you ask a key question, for example, how can I show that an integer is even, you can use the definition or you can use any of the alternatives. So you have lots of choices. That is a double-edged sword. You, that's actually a good thing because sometimes one alternative is better than the other. However, it can also be a disadvantage because you don't know which one to use. And so uh, that's life. OK. So what I want to do first is I want us to practice doing a proof in which we use a definition. An integer n is even if and only if n can be expressed as 2 times some integer. And here's what we want to prove. We want to prove that if n is an even integer, then n squared is an even integer. All right. So does anybody remember the very first step of doing a proof when you have an implication? Identify the hypothesis and the conclusion. Identify the hypothesis A and the conclusion B. The hypothesis A here is what? N is an even integer. N is an even integer. The conclusion is? N squared is an even integer. N squared is an even integer. Thank you, Professor Solo, for wording it in if-then form. That makes it easy, right? Good. The next thing you want to do is say to yourself, I can assume A is true. My job is to show that B is true. And then what I will urge you to start thinking about is, what proof technique should I use to get started here? So let me explain why this is important. Eventually, we're going to learn here approximately 10 or 12 different proof techniques. Let's say you have learned 
12 different proof techniques. And here is a new proposition that you want to prove. Here's the proposition, here are your 12 proof techniques. Which proof technique should you use for this problem? I, I urge you to make a conscious choice of proof techniques, and I'm going to show you how to do that as we go along. Right now, we only know one proof technique, so guess which proof technique we're going to use for this problem? Forward-backward? The forward-backward method. But I hope you appreciate that eventually we're going to have 12 techniques, and then will come the issue of deciding which proof technique to use to get started in the proof. For now, we will use the forward-backward method, and so let's start with the backward process. Look at the statement B here, and can somebody ask a key question for me? And I'll get it started. How can I show that? The square of a number is an even integer. A perfectly valid key question. Let me repeat that one. How can I show the square of a number is an even integer? Perfectly valid. Can anybody ask a similar but slightly different key question? How can I show that the integer n squared is even? How can I show that the integer n squared is even? That's very similar to what uh, was asked over here, but the problem with what you're asking is you've used notation. And you recall that I told you the best approach to ans asking this key question is not to use notation. So let's see if we can ask a different key question. What is n squared? What kind of a mathematical object is n squared? A number. A number. So you could more simply ask, how can I show that a number is even or an integer is even? So your question, how can I show that the square of, an, of a number is even, is perfectly valid. As a general guideline, my suggestion is ask the easiest question you can. And it's a lot easier to ask, how can I show that a number is even? rather than how can I show that the square of a number is even. Both are valid. Your choice. So, for today's discussion, the key question I'm going to focus on is, how can I show that an integer, namely n squared, is even? After you ask the key question, you've got to answer it. How can you show an integer is even? For today's lecture, I'd like us to use the definition. So look at the definition and see if you can answer the question, how can I show that an integer is even? According to the definition, what do we have to show? It is two times an integer. Yes, n squared has to be equal to two times some integer. And that becomes our new statement in the backward process. All right, so now when you look at B1, it says, I have to show that n squared can be expressed as two times some integer. The only question is? What integer? What integer, exactly. And in order to determine what integer, what I'm going to suggest that we do now is turn to the forward process. Let's work forward from A to see if we can find, figure out how to express n squared as 2 times some integer. So let's work forward from A. Let's go to the hypothesis A, which says n is an even integer. I can assume A is true. I can assume n is an even integer. What do you know as a result of that? n is equal to 2 times some integer. n can be expressed as 2 times some integer. Let's write that as a new forward statement. Because n is an even integer, by definition, n can be expressed as 2 times some integer. Let's give it a name. Let's call it k. n equals 2k for some integer k. Now, recall from the backward process, we're interested in what number? N, n squared. N squared. So why don't we work forward from here by squaring both sides? What happens when you square both sides here? What do you get? N squared is equal to 2k, the quantity squared. And what's that equal to by algebra? 4k squared, right? Remember I said you have to know your algebra. Okay, and now remember from B, remember from B1, we need to show that n squared can be written as 2 times something. So can you rewrite 4k squared as 2 times something? 2 times 2k squared. 2 times 2k squared, exactly. And now I hope you see that from a2, n squared can be written as 2 times some integer, that integer being 2k squared. And that's the end of this proof. It's that simple. What I hope you focus on in this example is how we use definitions both in the backward process to answer key questions and in the forward process to create new true statements. What I want to talk a little bit about next is 
notation because it can cause some problems. Let me give you a new definition here. An integer n divides an integer m, written n divides m, if and only if m can equals k times n for some integer k. So let's take a numerical example. An integer 4 divides 12 because 12 can be written as something times 4. What? 3 times 4. 3 times 4. That's what the definitions say. So what I hope you did in this example is you matched up the notation. You matched up the 4 to the n and the 12 to the m, and then you need 12 equals something times 4. Let's take an example of using this definition to answer a key question. Suppose you have uh, the following conclusion B. You have to show that the integer P divides the integer Q. So what's the key question here? How can I show that? The integer P divides the integer Q. The integer P divides the integer Q. No, you're using notation. Just say the same thing without notation. How can I show that? An integer divides another integer. Exactly. How can I show an integer divides another integer? So the correct key question here is, how can I show that an integer, yes, P, divides another integer, namely Q? How can you show one integer divides another integer? The definition? Yes, use the definition. And here, again, you need to match up the notation. In particular, what does P match to in the definition? P matches to N. N, right, P matches to N, and Q matches to M. And so you need to show that Q is equal to some integer K times P. Does everybody see this matching of notation? This becomes your new statement B1. Q is equal to K times P for some integer K. You can run into difficulties when the statement that you're working with has symbols that overlap with the symbols in the definition. And let me give you an example. So again, here's the definition. An integer n divides an integer m, written n divides m, if and only if m can be written as k times n for some integer k. There's the definition. OK, now suppose you want to prove that the integer k divides the integer n. So first of all, let's just look at b. Forget the definition. Let's just look at b. What is the key question here? How can I show that? An integer divides another integer. An integer divides another integer. Everybody OK with that? And now, when you go to use the definition, here you should see a problem. The problem is that your, your statement B uses the symbols K and N. The definition also uses the symbols K and N. That's what I call overlapping notation. But unfortunately, the symbols K and N in the definition are very different from the symbols K and N in the statement B. You need to watch out for this overlapping notation. When the statement you're interested in has the same symbols as those in the definition, but those symbols can have different meanings. So what do you do in a case like this? How do you deal with this overlapping notation? And the answer is to rewrite the definition. Let's simply rewrite the definition using symbols that don't overlap with your statement B. So let me give you an example. Instead of writing the definition using N and M and K, let's rewrite this defini definition, let's rewrite this definition using A, B, and C. Watch this. So an integer A divides an integer B, written A divides B, if and only if B can be written as c times a for some integer c. Now, when you go to your statement b, the integer k divides the integer n, you can ask the key question, how can I show that an integer divides another integer? But now it's easy to match the notation. k gets matched to a, and n gets matched to b. b. And now you have to show that n can be written as c times k for some integer c. Look at b1. Notice how I've used the definition. So the key to avoiding notational problems when the definition and your statement have overlapping notation is to simply rewrite the definition using symbols that do not overlap with your statement. Then match up the notation 
and write down the statement you need to show. So let me summarize. What we have learned in this portion is to use a definition in both the forward process to create new true statements and in the backward process to answer key questions. Any question about how this works? Because we're going to be doing this a lot. So you need to get comfortable at asking key questions and using definitions to answer them, working forward by definition. Okay, so definitions are one of the most common ways to uh, both work backward and forward, but they're not the only way. Something else that uh, I want to introduce you to is the ability to use previous knowledge. So what do I mean by previous knowledge? A previously proved proposition. Let me give you an example. Let's read this proposition and we're going to try to prove it. If the right triangle RST with sides of length R and S and hypotenuse of length T satisfies T equals the square root of 2 RS, then the triangle is isosceles. And you see the picture here. Okay, so of course you've identified your hypothesis A and your conclusion B. Next thing you want to do is choose a technique. We only have one, the forward-backward method. And now, let's ask a key question. What is the key question here? How can I show that a triangle is isosceles? OK, how can you show a triangle is isosceles? Show that two of the sides are equal. That comes from the definition. And what would that mean in this particular case? Which two sides are you going to try to show are equal? R and S. R and S. All right, that's using a definition to answer a key question. But that is not the only way to answer the key question, how can I show that a triangle is isosceles? Another way to answer a key question is to use a previously proved proposition. And in the backward process, when you are working backward and ask a key question, what you want to look for is a previously proved proposition whose conclusion is precisely the same as the conclusion of the proposition you're working with except perhaps for notation. So what we want to do here is we want to look for a previously proved proposition that has the same conclusion. The triangle is isosceles. Here's what we're trying to prove, proposition three. If the right triangle RST with sides of length R and S and hypotenuse of length T satisfies T equals the square root of two RS, then the triangle RST is isosceles. And let's call that A implies B. You have to show that A implies B. You don't know that that's true. You have to show that that's true. Okay. So to use previous knowledge, what you want to see, what you want to look for, is a previously proved proposition whose conclusion is exactly the same as this one. Does anybody know a previously proved proposition whose conclusion is exactly the same as this one except for the notation? Which one? The first proposition. Yes, the very first proposition we did. Here it is. If the right triangle XYZ with sides of length X and Y and hypotenuse of length Z has an area of Z squared over 4, then the triangle is isosceles. Let's call that C implies B. We proved this in lecture 2. And that means we have previous knowledge. And notice that the conclusion of proposition 1, which we've already proved, is exactly the same as the conclusion of Proposition 3, except for the notation. Okay, so let's look at what we're saying. We have to show that A implies B, that's Proposition 3. We already know that C implies B, that's Proposition 1. How can we use this previous proposition, C implies B? If we can show that A implies C, then we would be done, because after you prove A implies C, we have already previously proved that C implies B, and therefore A implies B, and that's what we were trying to show. Now, here's something very important. We have to show A implies C. So look at A here. That's this hypothesis from Proposition 3. Implies C. That's this hypothesis from Proposition 1. When you write A implies C, you want to use the notation of your current proposition. So here's what I should write when I write A implies C. 
if the right triangle RST with sides of length R and S and hypotenuse of length P satisfies T equals the square root of 2RS, then RST is a right triangle that has an area of T squared over 4. All right, so now what we propose to do is simple forward-backward method here to accomplish this. Can somebody help me with a key question here? How can I show that? A right triangle has a specific area. Yes, the area of a right triangle is equal to a specific number. Exactly. How can I show that the area of a right triangle is equal to a specific number? And how do you show the area of a triangle is equal to a number? What is the formula for the area? One half the base times the height. So I have to show that. One half of s times r equals t squared over 4. And in fact, this is very easy to do if you just work forward from the hypothesis t equals the square root of 2rs. Square both sides, and then divide both sides by 4, and you're done. Let me summarize. When you want to show that a implies b, one way to show that b is true is to look for a previously proved proposition whose conclusion is exactly the same. And then what you want to show is your hypothesis from your proposition imply the hypothesis of the previously proved proposition. You can also use previous knowledge to work forward. So let's take at least a conceptual idea of how that would work. Again, you want to prove A implies B. How do you use previous knowledge to work forward? To use previous knowledge in the forward process, look for a previously proved proposition whose hypothesis is exactly the same as yours, except perhaps for notation. So let's say you've already proved that A implies C. Now what you need to do is work forward from C to get to B. That is, you have to prove that C implies B, and then you're done. In proposition one, when we did that isosceles triangle in lecture two, we actually did work forward by previous knowledge. So let me remind you of where and how that happened. In the proof of proposition one, we had the knowledge of the hypothesis that x, y, z is a right triangle. And what do you know about right triangles from your previous knowledge? The Pythagorean theorem. And that's exactly what we did in terms of working forward in uh, lecture two. Because x, y, z is a right triangle, by the previous knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem, whose hypothesis is exactly that a triangle is a right triangle, we created the new statement x squared plus y squared equals z squared. For the rest of this lecture, what I want to talk a little bit about is some mathematical terminology that you're likely to encounter when you're doing proofs. So first of all, the concept of a proposition. A proposition is a true statement that you're trying to prove. No problem. A theorem is an important proposition. Who decides if it's important? It's up to you. It's a personal choice. Now, some theorems are very, very long and complicated. So what one often does is one breaks a very big proof into smaller pieces. So for example, you might first show that A implies C. Then as a separate proof, you show that C implies D. And finally, you show that D implies B, and then you're done. Each of those individual implications is called a lemma. So a lemma is a proposition that's used in the proof of a theorem. And finally, after you prove a theorem, it might be the case that some statement follows almost immediately from the fact that the, that the theorem is true. And that statement that follows almost immediately from the theorem is often called a corollary, a corollary to the theorem. So a corollary is a proposition that follows almost immediately from a theorem. So we have these four concepts, proposition, a theorem, a lemma, and a corollary. Then let me introduce the concept of an axiom. An axiom is a statement that we accept as being true without having to do a proof. For example, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. We accept that as being true without actually having to prove it. And that's what we call an axiom. Our next notational uh, item is the, the negation of a statement. What does it mean to say a statement is not true? And we sometimes write it with this little squiggly A. So the not of a statement is the negation of the statement. If A is true, not A is false. If A is false, not A is true. All right, now we've been working with the statement A implies B. And it turns out that there are three other statements that are closely related to A implies B. The first is B implies A. 
And that's called the converse of A implies B. So it could be the case that A implies B is true, but B implies A is not true. It could be the case that A implies B is true, and B implies A is true. That could be the case also. These are two separate statements. The inverse is not A implies not B. And the contrapositive statement is not B implies not A. I would urge you as an exercise to try and create truth tables for each of these three statements, the converse, the inverse, and the contrapositive. Now, what do I mean by create a truth table? Here's what I mean. List the four possible combinations of A and B. And in each of those four cases, determine whether this statement, for example, the converse, is true or false. In each of those four cases, determine if this statement, the inverse, is true or false. In each of those four cases, determine if this statement is true or false. I would urge you to do that as an exercise. What you should discover is that the statement A implies B is true under exactly the same conditions as not B implies not A. The contrapositive and the original statement A implies B, these two are identical in the sense that whenever A implies B is true, it turns out that not B implies not A is true, and vice versa. Whenever not B implies not A is true, it turns out that A implies B is true. This will come from the truth table. Similarly, when B implies A is true, it turns out that the inverse, not A implies not B is true, and vice versa, when not A implies not B is true, B implies A is true. Another term that you're likely to see is the concept of two statements being equivalent. A statement A is equivalent to a statement B, which we write A double arrow B, means that A implies B and B implies A. And that essentially means that whenever A is true, B is true. Whenever B is true, A is true. And if you recall, when we talked about definitions, remember you have a definition, and then you have something else, another statement that's just as good as a definition? You try to prove these two are equivalent. If this one is true, this one is true. If this one is true, this one is true. Then you know that they're essentially the same. Whenever one is true, the other is true. OK, let's make a summary of what we've learned in this lecture. First, what is a definition? A definition is an agreement between all parties for the meaning of a term. That's what a definition is. And in terms of doing proofs, we can use a definition, first of all, to answer a key question. How can I show that a triangle is isosceles? By definition, show that two of its sides are equal, have equal length. We can equally well use a definition to work forward. If I know that n is an even integer, then by definition, n equals 2k for some integer k. So we use definitions in both the forward and the backward processes. And again, let me remind you, it is very important for you to be able to use definitions in both of these processes, because we're going to do it over and over again. OK. Another way to work forward and backward is to use previous knowledge. And what do I mean by previous knowledge? A proposition that you have already proved in the past. So for example, let's talk about using previous knowledge in the backward process. So you want to show that A implies B is true. That's what your current proposition is. You have to show that A implies B is true. How do you use previous knowledge? Well, you look for a previously proved proposition whose conclusion is exactly the same as yours, except perhaps for notation. So find a previously proved proposition of the form C implies B. And then what you need to show is what? A implies C. A implies C. That becomes your job. All right, let's look at the same game in the forward process. How do you use a previously proved proposition in the forward process? Again, you want to prove that A implies B is true. To use a previously proved proposition in the forward process, look for a proposition whose hypothesis is exactly the same as yours, except perhaps for the notation. And then show that C implies B. And that becomes your job. And if you can do that, then you're done. That completes this lecture.